Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you back to class this morning, October 13th, 2020. Exactly three weeks from today is the election. And I can't help but reflect what a strange and sometimes bizarre time we're living through. Every time I come to class, I think about what's happened over the last two or four or five days. Last week, the president went into the hospital. This week, he's back on the campaign trail, holding mass events. So no one could expect the way things are going. And it is really, I can say, I think I'm probably the oldest person in this session. I've never seen anything like this. And I did just want to say, Ingrid and I were talking this morning, and it's been very unusual for me not to get to see you and for Ingrid also. So please feel free to make an appointment to see us. Our hours are on the front of the Canvas site or drop in. We've both been holding open office hours every week. So we'd love to get to meet you and see you more and please feel free to come by. Today's session follows up some of the critically important issues that we addressed last Thursday when we addressed the problem of race, racism, and the gigantic racial disparities that characterize the United States and have also characterized the COVID pandemic here. Um, today, we want to turn our attention to the problem of prisons and incarceration. And I was struck in preparing for today's session that there's data which shows that 20% of all the human beings incarcerated across the globe are in prison here in the United States, well over 2 million people. And that turns out to be about 20%. And I was reflecting on some of the data we've reviewed about the COVID pandemic. And the United States has 20% of the world's cases of COVID. And this, I think, we'll see today is more than just a coincidence. And the rise of an incarcerary state, the new Jim Crow, and I highly recommend for all of you who haven't had a chance to read Michelle Alexander's remarkable book, these issues in some ways characterize some of the distinctive and most problematic aspects of American society. We began the course by saying that pandemics illuminate the most profound problems, inequalities, injustices um, that the world knows. And certainly we're finding that here in the US. So we're really pleased to have a group of guest faculty experts who long before COVID were investigating and probing the problem of incarceration, the problem of incarceration and race and racism in the US. And their more recent work on COVID will inform their remarks today. So let me turn it over to Ingrid to introduce today's really distinguished panel. Thank you so much, Alan. And welcome back, everyone. And welcome to our three marvelous speakers today. Um, we are going to start today's session with Professor Crystal Yang, who is a professor here at our law school and also a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Professors Yang really, Professor Yang's teaching and her research really centers around this question of empirical law and economics, particularly in the area of criminal justice and consumer bankruptcy. And her current research has really been focused on the effects of the bail system on defendants' short and long-term outcomes and racial bias in the criminal justice system, and particularly the spillover effects also in, um, in deportation fears. And she's been working with a group called the National Commission on Correctional Healthcare during this time of the coronavirus pandemic, and has really been a leader in helping us understand the impact of incarceration on COVID and vice versa during this time. So we're really looking forward to hearing from her. Our second speaker 
is Dr. Kim Su, who is a physician anthropologist, as well as the medical director of the Harm Reduction Coalition, which is a national advocacy and capacity building organization that really works on promoting the health and dignity of individuals and communities impacted by drug use and really the, the racialized war on drugs and it's in New York City. And she's been a national leader in promoting harm reduction strategies and really has a deep expertise in the intersection of stigma and policy and the quality of care for incarcerated populations. And again, is going to be discussing this in this particular moment with COVID, particularly with underlying, these underlying risks that this population faces. And then our third speaker is Eric Reinhardt, who is an MD PhD candidate here at Harvard, as well as at the University of Chicago, who's also combining medicine and anthropology. And he has spent over five years really focusing on um, ethnographic engagement in the Chicago South Side neighborhood, really trying to unpack the long-term implications of the carceral and police um, system on community mental health and community health outcomes. And he's really used a particular focus on the lens of the Cook County Jail um, and recently published something in Health Affairs that's really focused again on this moment of this intersectionality of COVID and the criminal justice system. And so we're really eager to hear about um, his work on the south side of Chicago as well. So three amazing speakers, and we're looking forward to hearing from all three of them. So we'll start with um, Professor Yang. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much to Professors Brandt and Katz for inviting me. I'm looking forward to all the students' questions as well as hearing from the other panelists. So let me just share my screen. I have a couple of slides I'd like to share with you that present some results from a unique survey that we did in collaboration with uh, the National Correctional um, Commission of Healthcare, Commission on Correctional Healthcare. So as Professor um, Katz already mentioned, uh, my background is in both law and economics and I've long been interested in studying issues of inequality and it's hard to really impossible I would say to understand inequality in the United States without really thinking about our very unique and extended um, criminal justice system. And so this is a project that began as a collaboration with both my colleague, Marcella Alshan, who's a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School and who's trained as both an economist and also a physician who specializes in infectious diseases, as well as with the NCCHC. And the NCCHC, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a leading national nonprofit organization that seeks to accredit the healthcare provision um, of healthcare services within correctional facilities in the United States. They're actually one of the longest standing accredited organizations and resulted from a project with the American Medical Association, the AMA, that began in the 1970s. The AMA in the 1970s did a study of jail provision of health care and found that jails were woefully ill prepared to provide health services to the incarcerated population and decided to actually provide some sort of national standards if possible. Now what's perhaps surprising but also shocking is that there is no mandatory accreditation of healthcare services in correctional facilities, despite the importance of providing healthcare to incarcerated populations. And so most accreditation, even that via NCCHC, is actually done on a voluntary basis. But that means that there remains a lot of work to be done in improving healthcare access. And in fact, there's been a lot of anecdotal evidence that while jails and prisons are constitutionally required by the law to provide adequate provision of healthcare services, some jails have never in fact provided any healthcare. So there's a huge gap in what is actually um, happening for individuals that are currently incarcerated. So Professor Alsan and I had already been working with the NCCHC to better understand the impact of providing national standards and accreditation 
for inmate health as well as the well being of correctional and health staff when the pandemic struck. And when the pandemic struck, NCCHC came to us and told us that lots of correctional facilities were struggling to understand what they should be doing and how they could better serve their population. We realized, though, that there was a lack of high frequency national data to better understand the challenges that these facilities facing. And so in collaboration with the NCCHC, we decided to field a high frequency, hopefully nationally representative survey to correctional facilities to really understand what challenges they were facing, as well as track trends in how COVID-19 was spreading among these correctional facilities. So what we did was launch a first survey at the end of March 2020, when the sort of pandemic first started to strike and when the um, shutdowns began to happen. And for the next two or so months, we basically fielded additional daily or weekly surveys where we asked questions about jail access to testing, as well as the prevalence of COVID-19. And we were able to get over 300 different facilities across the United States to participate. These facilities um, house approximately 10% of the country's inmates, and they were well represented in terms of representing both jails and prisons, as well as juvenile detention facilities. So let me just present you some of our key findings from this study, which I think are important for understanding COVID and correctional facilities, as well as um, the challenges that these facilities faced. The first slide that I'm going to show you here is simply a tracking that we were able to do with our weekly surveys of total case counts reported by the facilities in our survey. What I have on the left side here is the total case counts among staff. These are correctional staff as well as healthcare staff. And on the right, I'm presenting for you the total COVID-19 cases among inmates. And what you see in these patterns is that during the course of our survey, we saw a rapid increase in case counts, just like we probably saw in our community, but this was also mirrored within correctional facilities, such that by the end of the survey in early June, there were well over 1,000 cases reported among staff in the facilities that responded to our survey, and almost 2,000 cases reported among inmates. Now, something surprising that was revealed to us in these tracking of case counts was that you'll see that the earliest rise, sharp rise in cases actually occurred among staff, which you see on the left hand side of the screen, rather than among inmates. And at first, this fact surprised us, but it helped us to speculate that perhaps staff at correctional facilities were an important source of transmission of the virus whether they were actually being exposed to it within the facilities or whether they were being exposed within the community and then potentially carrying the disease with them inside the facility. And to help us explore this, what we did was correlate the prevalence of case counts among staff, which I have here on the Y axis, as well as case counts from the community more broadly, which we obtained from the New York Times. And what you'll see from this figure here is that there's a strong correlation, a positive correlation between case counts in the community and correctional staff case counts, such that places, states like, for instance, uh, Michigan and New Jersey, which were particularly hard hit by the pandemic in the community, were also locations where correctional staff were affected early on and disproportionately affected. And of course, those staff may have been then uh, leading to inmates within the facilities also transmitting the disease. Now, something else we learned was that there is a substantial shortage early on in resources within these facilities. So in our survey, we asked about access to testing. Initially, surveys reported that only 64% of them had actually any access to testing. By the end of the survey, again, in the beginning of June, almost 90% of facilities reported that they had access to testing. So facilities also reported substantial shortages of personal protective equipment, what we might call PPE. Only 50% of responding facilities initially responded that they had adequate access to PPE. And indeed, among qualitative comments in our survey, we learned that facilities often did not even have soap or thermometer probes, and there were very saddening accounts of correctional staff, including nurses, who reported being very fearful of attending work because of the lack of resources that would be able to either protect them or the inmates. 
The last set of results that I want to provide with you that I think probably tie in very well with the issues of race is racism that you discussed, it sounds like last week, is an interesting finding from a couple of our surveys where we asked questions about the rate of COVID infection by the race of the inmate. We added this question later on in the survey. But what we consistently found was that the incidence rate for black inmates was two to three times higher than the incidence rate for white inmates. Now I'll have you ignore the last point here, which is June 4th, where there were just very few facilities that ended up responding. But you'll see, generally speaking, this black incidence rate is just much higher than the white incidence rate. And this led to a very important question we wanted to ask, which was why was this actually happening? Why was there a racial disparity in the incidence rate of COVID-19 case counts? Now, it turns out one of the reasons is just the institutional sort of systemic overrepresentation of Black individuals in the prison population. So, for instance, in 2017, Black individuals represented 12% of the U.S. adult population, but 33% of the sentenced prison population. And so what we found is that when we looked at the relationship between the share of Black inmates in a facility and the share of Black inmates that were infected with COVID-19, we generally find that that can explain a lot. That is, in other words, the overrepresentation of Black individuals within the criminal justice system can also explain why Black individuals are more likely to be infected with COVID-19. But what you also see from this graph is that there are facilities that are above this 45 degree line. In fact, there are 11 facilities above this line. These are facilities that you might say even have a disproportionate burden of COVID-19 among their Black inmates, even accounting for the fact that there is an overrepresentation of Black individuals in those facilities. Unfortunately, our survey was not able to answer why there's these facilities that seem to have this disproportionate burden, but we think that that's an incredibly important and crucial step question to study about understanding why these racial gaps are magnified even within correctional facilities themselves. And as an initial glance, we looked at some of the data and found that the facilities that seem to exhibit that disproportionate burden among Black mates, inmates are ones that have both a larger average daily population within their correctional facilities, which is often a sign of overcrowding, which can make social distancing very impossible, uh, very challenging. And there are also facilities that tend to have a lower share of health staff among correctional staff. So those are some signs suggesting to us that there might even be differential things happening for inmates by race, even within the same types of correctional facilities. So those are my main comments. I will just end there. But I'll just note that in my work on the criminal justice system and thinking about COVID, I think it's important to think of strategies in helping manage the rise of the pandemic in correctional facilities, not just from a health perspective, but often from a criminal justice policy perspective as well. We can provide correctional facilities with all the PPE. We can provide correctional facilities with the testing that they need to detect COVID. But overcrowding is a real challenge for trying to maintain social distancing. And that means if we want to holistically sort of deal with the pandemic in a fair and equitable manner within these facilities, we also have to think about why there is such a massive overrepresentation of individuals within our criminal justice system and think about sound criminal justice policies that can start to reduce our mass incarceration um, in our country. So thanks very much and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Yang. I think that's a a critical way to start this conversation, both in the interface between staff and incarcerated populations, because that's clearly a source of, um, of, of bringing COVID into that enclosed population, but also all of the inherent injustices that you discussed in there, both racial as well as overcrowding. And so I think this is an important framework that we can lead with. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'll pass it on. Um, to Dr. Sue. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to build off. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Um, so um, I'm going to try to build off the previous speaker's um, work and, and really talk as a physician anthropologist from the experience of taking care of people uh, as, a, as a 
internal medicine doctor as an anthropologist um, at Rikers uh, in the beginning of the, the pandemic here in March. So uh, I just moved to Yale actually. So I just took a job at Yale. So I'm about a week into New Haven. Um, but uh, I still remain the medical director at Harm Reduction Coalition. And previous to that, I was also working uh, as, a, as a clinician educator at Rikers. So I think it's gonna dovetail quite nicely actually with this big picture overview of what's happening in prisons and jails uh, in the United States. Um, and these are issues that I've been working on for a long time uh, that are addressed in my, in my book, my new book, uh, Getting Wrecked. Um, and so a lot of these, the <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the structural violence and inequalities that I've, that I've been thinking about for, for many years really um, have, uh, have created the groundwork for COVID to, um, I'm trying to think of what's a, an interesting and you know, apt metaphor, but really have just allowed COVID to spread like wild, wildfire. Um, uh, you know, so I'm going to talk really about Rikers. Um, so Rikers had been we can, you know, it's a very, it's an interesting case study. I think that that's that's um, important uh, around the country. You know, Rikers have been attempting to uh, do decarceration uh, pretty aggressively before COVID. Really had a standing a standing daily population uh, of around ten or eleven thousand only five years ago, and the current population right now is around fifty four hundred. So. You know, Rikers Island is a jail, so I, I'm not sure if you guys know the distinction between a jail and a prison, but a jail is a place where people have, you know, are pre-trial or they're detained. And some jails, including the jail where I did my research in Boston, um, also actually serve people with short sentences. So Rikers actually does have a couple buildings for people that are sentenced for less than one or two years. So does Boston. And Rikers Island is an interesting place, very cl close to LaGuardia, actually. Uh, it's very hard to get to. It's, um, it's, it's a, a island that's like a building of complexes. It's like a mini city. And like uh, Crystal was saying, um, there's so much uh, movement, it really. There's so many staff that drive onto the island. There's, there's ways that that you get onto the island. I actually tried to ride my bicycle onto the island, which is impossible, actually. You have to park and then take a public bus and then like nine or 10 buses to get to the building that you're working in. So there's probably, I'd say, currently active, there's probably eight or 10 buildings. And actually one of the buildings um, uh, had actually been closed. So there, there you might've been, um, aware of the attempt to close Riker, the, the, the campaigns to close Rikers Island. So there were a couple different campaigns going on, but this building, the EMTC had actually just closed, um, which they reopened to become a COVID unit. Um, basically, uh, I, it was very interesting to be on the ground uh, because the, the medical staff and as well as the security staff, which, which constantly um, have uh, tension, always have tension, was, was really quite difficult because we didn't know what we were going to do. You know, the medical staff, in fact, we can talk about this, really stood up to the security staff um, and, and was like, we have to decarcerate, like, <laughs> this is a disaster. Um, so under the leadership of some of the progressive, you know, medical staff really stood up against corrections and said, you know, we are going to get like our patients are going to get, you know, slaughtered by COVID in this it, because of the these circumstances. So I was actually uh, seeing patients. So when I go to Rikers, I see patients as a primary care doctor, um, as a uh, sick call doctor. So I do urgent care, and then I also run to any medical emergencies. Like people try to hang themselves, people are found down, people are beat up. I run to the unit. Okay, so. There's a variety of different things that you do uh, as a doctor on Rikers. Um, and I was going in and I, I remember my first, I was working in what is actually called the tombs, which is in Manhattan. And we were trying to figure out exactly this. I saw this patient, uh, you know, he's a 55 year old black patient who actually, um, had just come back from Cornell and they, had, they, they were, they suspected because he had a fever that he had COVID. 
And we didn't know where people with COVID were going to go. Honestly, we didn't know how to keep them separate from the popu from the general population. So he, we were just making as we were doing. I mean, we were literally, we literally didn't know, you know, how, you know, what was going to happen. So I suspected he had COVID. So we had, they had reopened this unit, EMTC. They also had another unit called the Communicable Disease Unit, which is an old TB unit that's about 70 beds. Um, so people could go there, some negative pressure rooms for people that had TB. But we knew those units were gonna be overwhelmed very quickly. We were very afraid, so they opened EMTC. So I had sent him basically transferred him to, I was going to transfer him out of the building that I was in so that he could go to this COVID positive or suspected COVID, COVID um, building. And right as I was leaving my shift that day, uh, they called back and they're like, oh, he's COVID positive. And at that time he was, he had a fever and he had, but he had no other symptoms. Um, you know, as a, it was honestly terrible because people were so afraid and, and there was fear of the, from the staff there was medical staff, there was fear from the patients. The patients were afraid of staff because staff, as Crystal said, were basically seen as carriers, like they were seen as bringing it onto the island. And many doctors were afraid of bringing it to their patients, you know. So really, there was, that was going on. And, um, and so there was fear also from the officers as well. So there was like, just there was myriads of different fears. So I sent him to the EMTC unit and, and he did okay. It was, it was really quite difficult because we were also doing these complex calculations. We opened, me and some of the other infectious disease doctors on the island, we were opening up, you know, trying to figure out, okay, like, so this person's last fever, 14 days, the same stuff that we were talking about with Trump, like, you know, we were trying to do for our patients at Rikers, like, so last symptom this day, we were trying to do, input it into the spreadsheet to try to figure out like when can they go back to a regular unit when are they not infectious like we didn't know it was just in march too we were like really trying to comb through the literature and trying to you know again like make little p policies as we were going um, a lot of the units are gymnasiums where beds are three and a half feet apart um, there is a unit that we have for sick patients who are above 50 and and um they're on dialysis, they have advanced HIV, they have cancer, they have type one diabetes, they have canes. I mean, there are patients that you know, have significant infections um, that are in dormitory style uh, living um, so that they could um, basically have um, closer nursing and, and they were very vulnerable. Um, so, um, you know, I, I tweeted a little bit from this at the time and you know, I was really scared, honestly. It was very, um, it was very, it was evolving for all of us. Um, one thing that I would say though, is that decarceration efforts started to happen. At the same time, on the other end, what I do is work mostly with people with, um, people who use drugs. And I was particularly worried that in decarceration efforts, and I started hearing it from around the country is that people were actually had no place to go. The, the places that they normally would go after leaving prison and jail were gone. Uh, the drop-ins were gone. Um, you know, access to low barrier services, including medication for opioid use disorder were not there. And so people were, are at very high risk of an opioid overdose after coming out of, a, uh, out of prison or jail. Uh, because of loss of tolerance and stress and trauma and not even just opioid overdose, but also just death uh, and morbidity and mortality generally. So again, trying to think about a safe, you know, trying to think both about keeping people safe, keeping people alive, keeping people healthy, and trying to, the bigger overarching macro policy would be to get people home, but how to get people back into the community safely with what they need uh, was, was difficult. So I'll leave it at that and hopefully we can have some some discussion uh, about some of those things, but it, it you know, it, just from a, the perspective of being on the ground in in these in these spaces, it was it was quite scary. Oh, one more thing: the officers, the correctional officers, advocate lobbied really hard for the masks. Um, they, they lobbied really hard for N95s, and they were not even wearing them. I mean, honestly, it was like heartbreaking because N95s were this, like, they were just this like symbol this like to you know this of like safety and and 
no one had them at the time and, and the officers were having them and they were just, you know, wear them or, you know, around their necks, they wear, you know, and they, and honestly, it was, it was very difficult to kind of see the power that they had, but also, and, and, and they were also, um, di they also died. I mean, many officers and transit workers and other people in your city died. So it was very hard for us, hard for me to kind of see that happen and to not understand, you know, um, how we could do better, but many, many, you know, so it's, so it's a very interesting thing about, you know, the interplay of, of, of how that played out. And I'm, you know, would like to think about how looking back, we could have, have done it better. Um, so I'll leave it at that with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sue. I think there's so many important issues that you raise there, both um, around the compounding health risks that a lot of the population, the incarcerated population face, both from chronic diseases and also the risk, as you said, when there are when all of the services that they could access if they were to leave the penal system are shut down, the risks there associated with um, homelessness and potential for overdose are just so incredibly high. And I, I think about the fact as a physician at a very well-resourced hospital and the challenges we were facing in March around PPE and conceptualizing the health of staff and patients and how compounded that must have been on Rikers Island. I can only imagine based upon your story, how complex that, that is. So thank you so much for sharing that. And we are going to pass it over um, to Eric Reinhardt for our final speaker. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, some of what I'll say now will overlap with what has already been said by Alan and by uh, Professors Yang and Dr. Sue. Um, so because I think the students have been assigned the, the piece from health affairs called incarceration and its disseminations, I don't want to go straight into the details of that study, but first zoom out to the broader context and then try to convey what we were trying, my co-author Daniel Chen and I, what we were trying to interject in relation to in that piece and then the subsequent work we're continuing to do now. Um, so as I think you all know now, US jails and prisons are the leading sites of SARS-CoV-2 spread in the country, arguably the world. They comprise 90 of the top 100 COVID-19 clusters as of September. Um, we've been hearing this for so long about these huge epidemics in jails and prisons that they've almost been naturalized. I think it's important to shake that. Uh, so the national context in which this is happening, you know, the US is the wealthiest country in the world. We spend more per capita on healthcare than any other place in the world. We actually have rather low population density, a bunch of factors that contribute to an expectation that we'd be able to handle the coronavirus quite well. And in fact, that's clearly not happened at all. We have 4.3% of the global population in the US, 21% of the global COVID-19 burden as of yesterday, and about 23% of the world's incarcerated population. Uh, and as Alan mentioned, these are, I, I agree, these are not coincidences, the near overlap of the COVID burden and the incar uh, incarcerated population. Um, it's also important, I think, to denaturalize that mass carceral system, just Briefly, by way of background, I highly recommend, as Alan did, the, the new Jim Crow, but also Elizabeth Hinton, who's one of your faculty at Harvard, her book on the history of mass incarceration. As a reference point, in 1975, there were only 400,000, still a lot of people, too many people, but 400,000 incarcerated people in the US. By 2008, and the number's about the same now, 2.3 million people in jails and prisons and other carceral contexts, and an additional 4 million people on probation and supervisory release. Um, it's a politically constructed phenomena that, that can be otherwise, and that's important to remember that. Um, so when I first started thinking that I ought to do some quantitative work on this issue, because in fact my work is ethnographic, and I've worked in Cook County Jail, but not focusing on structural violence associated with incarceration and policing, but more actually on aesthetic practices, pushing back against the urban sociological tradition that has written the South Side of Chicago through all of these frames of structural violence and foreclosed other ways of knowing myself. So this is quite different from the ordinary work that I do. But because I'd been inside the jail and I'd seen the different processing spaces, it was clear to me what would be happening epidemiologically. And it wasn't coming out in the media. I wasn't seeing research. I thought, okay, I can get this data. I should do, I should do these studies. So the initial focus in March, when media and a lot of editorials and um, medical journals were coming out, was on the phenomena of epidemics inside prisons and jails. Of course, this is really important. Um, 
There are vulnerable populations in jails. We do not, as, as Professor Yang was saying, we do not have high quality healthcare in jails and prisons in the US. We have um, very high risk populations there with significant comorbidities. And although the average uh, age of the incarcerated population is below the average age of the general population, you do have a significant elderly population, people over 65 serving long sentences who are at very, very high risk. So there's a study in JAMA, a research letter in JAMA that showed significantly higher death rates in prisons, uh, this came out in July, and a really much higher death rate among people over 65 in prisons. And as uh, Professor Yang was mentioning, also severe overcrowding. So this has been brought before the UN um, Human Rights Council many times, the overcrowding US prison and jail system. And this makes for nearly impossible conditions for infection and control. So the early political response to this, the policy response was to call for early releases. We need compassionate releases of people at high risk from severe COVID-19 outcomes, which is, uh, it seems obvious, like this is really important. Uh, I fully embrace that, but it seemed to me that it was missing a really big piece of the puzzle, um, which is that jails and prisons, when you have epidemics inside of them, they will not stay inside of these facilities. In carceral uh, facilities and communities are in constant biosocial interaction. Uh, biological phenomena in jails and prisons are going to be going in and out through the staff, but also through the constant circulation of detainees. Um, so this is a public health problem for everybody. And this seemed to me to be an important aspect of the problem to address for COVID-19 control at a population level. But also, I mean, the mass incarceration system in the US is so deeply entrenched. This seemed like a, an unusually good opportunity to make people recognize that this system does not just harm people of color, it does not just harm the poor, it does not just harm the incarcerated, it harms everybody. And we need to mobilize. This is true all the time, and especially during COVID-19, we need to mobilize to confront it. So I thought this could be a, a useful wedge issue in some way. So I wanted to focus on it. Uh, first, I mean, um, Dr. Sue mentioned this, the difference between prisons and jails. This is really important to understand. You hear policymakers at the national level speaking and not understanding the basic distinction. It's important to recognize. So prisons house people who have been sentenced, uh, who have been convicted of crimes, typically sentenced uh, to terms longer than one year. About 600,000 people are released from prisons in the US every single year. A very conservative estimate, in my view, put out by the, the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU, says that for at least 39% of the people in the US prison population, there is no public safety justification for their continued incarceration. Um, now, I can move to jails and keep that figure in mind, 39%, because it's much higher in jails, uh, and Professor Yang's work actually supports that idea. So jails, um, um, her really important AER study that came out in 2018 on the effects of pretrial um, detention, which I'll mention in a bit. So um, jails, you know, 600,000 people released from prisons every year, 10.6 million admissions to U.S. jails every year. That's 4.9 million distinct individuals cycle through these facilities, but some people are arrested multiple times. 75% um, of, on any given day, you have about 600,000 people in the US in jails. 75% of those people, roughly, are pretrial detainees. They've not been convicted of a crime. According to Professor Yang's study of Miami-Dade County and Philadelphia County, um, so they're not representative of the entire country, but they're two very large counties, 42% of people held in pretrial detention will not be convicted of the alleged offenses for which they've been detained. Um, this is important to keep in mind when we're incurring enormous risk by incarcerating these people to begin with. Why are they there? Do they really need to be there? Whose interest is served by keeping them there? Another important part of jails that makes them very important for COVID-19 control is that the populations turn over very, very quickly. Uh, under ordinary circumstances, and it's actually grown under COVID-19 because there's faster release, Jail populations turn over, about 50% of the jail population turns over every two weeks. Many people stay only hours, days, uh, or less than, than two weeks. The people who stay longer than that uh, generally fall into two categories. Those who can't pay cash bail, and um, the median bail for a felony is 10K. Uh, misdemeanors, I, I can't find a figure, but it's significantly lower. The people who can't pay, the average income of men who can't pay cash bail, $16,000 a year, women, $11,000 a year. So there's a huge overlap, intersection with poverty and discrimination against the poor in our criminal justice system. And then there are about 25% of detainees in jails who are there serving misdemeanor um, uh, convictions, uh, sentences for misdemeanor convictions that are less than a year typically. Okay, so jail cycling. 
uh, I perhaps shouldn't have used this term in the health affairs paper because it's confused people, but people are, are arrested, they're transported to jails, they're processed, they're booked, and then they're released. This is the jail cycle. And many of these people are rearrested within a short order of time. Of those who are, people who serve, who are arrested more than one time in the year, jail more than one time in the year, 49% of them have incomes less than $10,000. Um, so, and also Professor Yang's study, which I really highly recommend everybody read in AER, uh, showed that pretrial detention, detention severely harms economic well-being and future opportunities. So jailing, our criminal justice system, and specifically jails, deepens and reproduces poverty, producing a, a kind of a really horrific feedback loop. The other issue at stake here, uh, like I mentioned earlier, is public safety. According to the Vera Institute for Justice, only 5% of arrests in the US, um, over 12 million arrests every year in the US, only 5% of them are for serious violent offenses. That means for 95% of arrests, uh, some are, they're like class two violent crimes, um, but for the vast majority of them, uh, certainly over 80%, there is no continued threat to public safety. Uh, and we could, we could bring that number much higher. And even the people who are arrested for violent crimes, many of them, there's not a real reason to suspect they're going to re-offend. Um, we've been seeing this recently in, in Chicago around people uh, jailed for, actually for, for gun violence associated crimes. Um, so jails and COVID-19, uh, Emily Wang at Yale, uh, who Dr. Sue has just joined, she's a, a physician researcher, very important, uh, doing very important research on criminal justice. She has a study that shows that the COVID-19 reproduction ratio in a large urban jail, unnamed, is eight. It's extremely high. That's higher than the Princess Diamond cruise ship in an entirely enclosed environment. So that, as far as I know, it's the highest institutional reproduction ratio that we've seen. And I don't think that this is distinctive to this one jail. I suspect this is, if not entirely generalizable, to some degree generalizable. So who does this reproduction ratio affect? It's not just the incarcerated. 200,000 people, according to the Marshall Project, go in and out of US jails every week. That's staff and detainees, huge turnover. So there's a constant penetrate, biological interpenetration between these facilities and communities. So COVID-19 in jails is not gonna stay in jails. It already hasn't. So when I started doing this, the health affairs study in March, that was what I wanted to look at. What is to what degree is the outbreak that we saw at Cook County Jail affecting surrounding communities? Um, so Cook County Jail is the largest single site jail in the US. Some people dispute this. It's the third largest uh, jail system. It's big, but it's only one of 92 county jails in Illinois. Our study looked at the effect of this, not the effect, it's not a randomized controlled trial. I can't infer causality, but looked at the association between cycling through this one jail and then case rates, documented case rates in zip codes in Illinois. We found when we control for race, poverty, it's a root, as Dr. Yang will know, it's like a very rudimentary study, but it's, it's what I could do at that moment. It's the data I could get. And I thought it was important to try to put something out to bring attention to this issue. So 16% of all cases in both Chicago and statewide in Illinois, as of April 19th in our study, are attributable to the cycling of people through Cook County Jail in just the month of March. We didn't have data on staff, so I suspect this is likely a significant underestimate of actual uh, COVID-19 cases attributable to this single jail. Jail cycling through this one facility was the strongest predictor by far of COVID-19 case rates, far exceeding uh, the prediction, predictive capacity of race, poverty, population density, uh, and all the controls we use there. So the epidemiological consequences of jail cycling um, are not distributed evenly. This is perhaps unsurprising. They disproportionately affect marginalized communities. So as Dr. Uh, Yang was mentioning, 37% uh, of the US population is comprised of people of color. 67% of the incarceration population uh, is comprised of people of color. Black men have a one in three lifetime risk of incarceration. That's you know, over six times, or actually it's slightly under, six times greater than that of white men. You put structural racism into the criminal justice system. And now during a pandemic, you're going to get structural racism out in terms of infectious disease. So we have another study now under review, Daniel and I again, um, that updates. We didn't have longitudinal data for our initial study. We only had a cross section. So we could look at what are the infection rates as of April 19th. We couldn't see every day. Since then, we've acquired, although there were obstructions put up, maybe we can talk about this by actually public health authorities, but the city of Chicago made it publicly available. So we got longitudinal data. So we can answer some more questions that we couldn't answer before and show that reverse causality is not going to explain our findings. 
we find that as of August, um, the multiplier effect of putting people through the jail increases, uh, unsurprisingly, so that for every person that was cycled through Cook County Jail in March, by August, you have five additional cases in their zip code, independently attributable. You know, so you, you control for all the other factors. We have over 1,700 controls that we use, uh, including testing rates, for example. Um, and we find that 87% of these jail-acquired infections that then spread within zip codes uh, are borne by black, black and Hispanic majority zip codes. If you look at the individual level, I suspect it's even higher than 87%, but all we have is the zip code level. So um, you look at that. that just that explains 21% of the racial disparities in COVID-19 across zip codes in Chicago. Just March jail cycling. Uh, you look at subsequent months, it, it gets bigger. Um, so jail cycling in this study, which is a little bit more robust than our previous one, is still by far the strongest predictor of COVID-19 case rates. So there are a few important issues. I, I'm a little over time, so feel free to cut me off and s save, uh, save this for questions if you prefer. Okay. Right. So there are important issues that have <laughs> kept me awake uh, at night as I've been trying to do this, which is testing. So one of the reasons that jail cycling is really important to think about is because we're trying to control the epidemic right now, the policy level through releases and testing. So as of late April, there's universal testing at Cook County Jail, testing at time of booking. Now, when you are arresting and booking hundreds of people every single day, they go through, and it's even more than this, actually go through local holding facilities. They're transported in vans. They're put in bullpens in tight quarters, tip at early at least without masks. I don't know about now. They won't really talk to me much. I'm not popular at Cook County Jail anymore. Um, that's a very high risk time for exposure. If somebody has just been exposed to the virus and then you test them that same day or the next day, they're not going to come back positive, even if they have in fact been infected. There's a necessary incubation period. So testing at time of booking, when the highest risk period for contraction of the virus for these people is in the processing period is inadequate. And it's worse than that, it's misleading. A lot of people are subsequently being released, believing that they're negative for the virus when there's actually no basis at all to believe that. Um, that's a huge issue. The other issue is what kind of tests they're using. Are you using antigen, the rapid antigen tests, which have you know, a significant uh, false negative rate? Are you using PCR tests? If you're, are you doing antigen with PCR confirmation? If you're using PCR, uh, you're relying in most places upon state laboratories. In the past months, we've seen delays of 11, 12 days to get test results. Most people who are booked into the jails are not even staying that long. What's happening with those test results? Are those counted, if they come back positive, are they counted as part of the jail rate? Are, is there contact tracing? Are people being contacted? There are huge issues at play here. And you have to understand that this all is occurring within a very heavily politicized context. County jails are run by county sheriffs. These are elected officials. Uh, Sheriff Dart uh, is a very ambitious politician in Chicago. Uh, this is very well known. He has higher aspirations, but he's also you know, been very politically active in his current position. He aggressively pursues PR. I know because his comms team has called me quite often uh, very angry. Um, and they have a very big, they has, has a higher communications, a bigger communications team than perhaps a data team, it seems. Um, so these are the people who produce the data. They control the data. They control access to the data. There's very little regulatory oversight. Uh, in some places, it seems to me that there's basically none. I mean, uh, Dr. Yang may know uh, quite a bit more about this than I do. Um, this is a huge problem. So just pushing for transparency, as there are two legislative acts right now in Congress by uh, Congresswomen um, Presley and, uh, and um, Warren, it's important, but it's inadequate. You have to know if the data is high quality. You have to know if it's being manipulated. You have to know what the testing procedures are. Data by itself says nothing. You need to know what the data reflects. Um, and we don't have adequate provisions to ensure that right now. So that's a really big issue. Um, and then, okay, just, I'll try, I, I, this just a couple more minutes on decarceration. So decarceration is obviously what we need for infection control within these facilities. It's also what we need for infection control uh, for the broader public, but it's been woefully inadequate. There's a very important piece, I think, that came out in Lancet Infectious, Lancet Infectious Diseases last week uh, called uh, Decarceration and Community Reentry, something else in the title, but it's, it's open access. It's very good and important. They summarize the situation quite well. Jail populations declined 
there was some jurisdictions who made a concerted effort to reduce their jail populations in part for PR reasons. So 740,000 people in jails at the beginning of the outbreak, roughly, by mid-July, that had climbed to 580. It's since gone back up, not all the way back up to 740, but the trend is reversed. And Daniel and I have another study we've been working on, uh, we're trying to finalize now, that looks at a national county level analysis. What is the effect of reducing jail populations? And we see that it's very significant. It's on par with the most ambitious anti-contagion policies we have around masking, around uh, uh, stay-at-home policies. This is a very important uh, infection control measure, not just for inside these facilities, although it's vital there, but for the broader public. And it's not being remote, it's not being utilized remotely enough right now. Uh, the total incarcerated population looking at jails and prisons is only about down 11% during the pandemic. Um, also, as I mentioned, it really matters how we decarcerate. If you're just taking people in, not shutting off kind of the front end issue of insane numbers of arrests and jailing, you're just releasing people faster. You're still exposing people to the virus and probably not catching it in many instances. You're diffusing the risk into the community. Uh, it may look better because your jail populations are lower. You're not as the sheriff responsible for a big outbreak, but the public health consequences are not being rationally dealt with in this case. Um, so I'll just, I mean, to, to, so I think it's very clear we need large scale decarceration. We need releases, but we also need to address the front end issue. You need to turn off the tap, stop these insane rates of arrests and jailing. Um, and then uh, we need an independent oversight body because it's, you know, in Chicago, for example, the sheriff is an elected official, but the people in the uh, city department of public health are very closely tied to political structures. They have interests as well. We need a non-local national oversight body that is really administering testing and data access and data provision. And then to, to Kim's, um, to Dr. Kim's, Dr. Sue's point, sorry. Uh, uh, we need to decarcerate, but also couple this with corresponding investments. If you're looking at recidivism by releasing people, but then not actually addressing housing insecurity uh, and associated issues, like you have a, it doesn't make any sense to do that. We have to couple decarceration with real community investments. So, okay, I'm sorry, I'm way over time, but thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Eric. That was really great. I have to say, I just learned so much from this panel. And I think we have so many sort of broad assumptions about prisons, jails, and incarceration. And we have a lot of great questions in the queue. So I'm going to bring up students right now. But just one quick observation is the complexity of our incarcerary state is so intricate. It's poorly regulated. We don't have adequate health care in it the churn or cycling that goes back and forth makes it much more fundamentally connected to people around it and communities and other institutions. So these are things that I don't think people clearly understand, but they're really the result of the kind of close observation that the three of you have done. And it's striking to me, it will require many different disciplinary and analytic and policy approaches to address this because all three of you have multiple training and I can think of the deep historical aspects, the incredibly complicated clinical aspects and scientific aspects of testing, not to mention the really powerful social and political reforms in which this you know, very highly structured systemic system is embedded. So it raises really broad questions. The students have some great questions. So let's go to um, student questions now. <laughs> 